Hey guys, Dr. Childs here. Today, we're going to be talking about the symptoms associated with a high TSH, otherwise known as thyroid stimulating hormone. We're going to be talking about which symptoms are associated with a high TSH. We're going to help you define what a high TSH is because that's a little bit controversial. We'll talk about that. And we're going to, I'm going to help you to understand if your symptoms are related to your TSH or to something else. If you don't know me, I'm Dr. Childs. I'm an internist and I specialize in treating thyroid problems, um, helping people balance other hormone issues, and then also helping patients with weight loss. So I take a functional and integrative approach to these problems. So if you're interested in any of these things, make sure you subscribe and hit the notification bell because I think you're going to like what we talk, what we're going to be talking about. So let's jump into our topic, which is high TSH symptoms. So the SX here is an abbreviation for symptoms. Don't let that confuse you. Um, to jump into this topic, we really need to define a little bit about just the physiology of the thyroid. We'll talk about the optimal levels. Then what we'll do is we'll talk about, hopefully you can see these, we'll talk about the symptoms associated with having a high TSH. So first, let me just reorient you to where we're talking about in your body. So in your thyroid, the way that your thyroid functions, it starts in the brain, goes to the thyroid gland, then goes to the rest of the body. And there's something we call a feedback loop involved here. So what happens is the pituitary, which is in your brain, secretes the hormone TSH. And that's really the bell of the ball today. It's not the most important thyroid test, by the way, but it's really what we're going to be talking about today and spending our time and attention on. So TSH is actually produced by your brain, by the pituitary gland, and it acts on the thyroid. And TSH makes your thyroid gland, or it tells your thyroid gland, to pump out T4 and T3, which are thyroid hormones. Now, there's a little more complexity down here. We're not going to get into that because that's for a different topic, but conversion and cellular activation and things like that are important and you should know about those. Um, but let's focus on the TSH. So the TSH says, hey, thyroid gland, you need to produce thyroid hormone. So as, and, and what, pe what confuses people is that a high TSH is associated with low thyroid numbers, okay? So a high TSH means low or sluggish thyroid gland. And that's confusing because you may think, well, high TSH is, you know, uh, means that maybe we're producing too much, too many hormones, and that's not the case. So let me just explain why that is. So what happens is, as your thyroid gland produces T4 and T3, those hormones come back to the pituitary in the feedback loop that I'm talking about, and they say, hey, brain, we have enough thyroid hormone, you don't need to produce any more TSH, and you don't need to tell the thyroid gland to produce any more. But what happens if these values drop? If the T4 and the T3 drop in the serum, they drop in your peripheral tissues, then they're not going back and sending the message to the brain to say, hey, uh, we basically what they're saying is, hey, we don't have enough. So the brain says, oh, I know what to do. We're going to increase the TSH and we're going to try and tell the thyroid gland, we're just going to push on it, like pushing the, you know, the gas in your car. We're going to push, 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 trying to force your thyroid gland to produce even more thyroid hormones. So that's why a high TSH is almost always associated with low uh, thyroid function or a sluggish thyroid. That's how that feedback loop works. Yes, there's some more nuances there, but we're not going to focus on that. So that's why the high TSH matters. Now, if you've heard my talk about other topics, like other TSH uh, values, I've talked before about having a low TSH and why that's a little more confusing. So if you haven't watched that video, I would encourage you to watch that now. But today we're talking about a high TSH, and this one's far less confusing because if you have a high TSH, it's almost always, with few exceptions, going to cause hypothyroidism. Remember, it's associated with a low amount of thyroid uh, hormones fluctuating in your body, so low T4 and T3, which causes hypothyroidism symptoms, and we're going to talk about those symptoms in just a minute. But before we get into the symptoms, let me tell you about what sort of ranges you should be looking for, because remember, this TSH has a wide range of options that you can test at any time. So if your doctor takes a test in the morning and they say, hey, um, your TSH is fine. And you're saying, well, wait a minute, I have fatigue, I have weight gain, I have all these things. And I read online or whatever I, I saw on WebMD or my website or whatever. I saw that those these symptoms could be associated with a sluggish thyroid. What gives? Well, here's how your doctor's looking at it. There's a difference between optimal and then the standard sort of conventional range. Now, most doctors are trained to look at this standard way. They're looking at a standard way and they're basing this off of the reference range of the lab test itself. And they're not even going to tell you you have a thyroid problem generally until your TSH is greater than 4.5 to 5.5. And it, it depends on the test. Whoop, that should be a 5. 5.4.5 to 5.5. And it depends on the test uh, and, and the lab company. That's why there's a range there. But generally speaking, if it's outside of the range, your doctor might say, hey, now you have a problem. But newer studies have come out, which have shown that a TSH greater than 2.5 or 2.0 to 2.5, that's actually a problem. And so that has been um, reconfirmed by looking at various healthy populations of people and asking the question, you know, when do they start to experience thyroid problems? And it turns out that a, a lot of our previous studies 
were confounded by the fact that a lot of people have Hashimoto's that remain undiagnosed. So you were, we were including those people in these population studies and we were actually found the wrong range as a result of that. So, but again, these are studies are new, so your doctor may not be aware of it. So what I'm saying here is the optimal range, the range at which you most likely will not experience these symptoms, which we'll talk about, is somewhere greater than a TSH greater than 0.5 to 2.5. So somewhere in between this range here. So 0.5 to 2.5, but definitely less than 2.5, kind of no matter what. It, once you start getting above the 2.0 to 2.5 range, that de kind of depends on the studies. I personally think 2.0 is the, is the best, but I'm including this 2.5 here just to give us a little wiggle room. Any TSH greater than that, you're almost always going to have symptoms of hypothyroidism because that's, again, the indication that the thyroid is not functioning. All right, so now that you have that, let's talk about the symptoms that you might be experiencing. Because again, you're going to be told, you're going to try to be your doctor's going to sell you the story that your thyroid is fine. If, let's say you come in at 3.5. Let's say your TSH is 3.5 and you're saying, hey, I feel really poorly. And your doctor's going to say, no, it's definitely not the problem because they're going by this range. But if you go by my range, you are a little bit off. Okay, so what symptoms am I talking about here associated with this, this thyroid? Now, these are the symptoms of hypothyroidism. Remember, hypo means low. So low thyroid hypothyroidism. That's what we're really talking about. And these symptoms start with things like weight gain. So the weight gain can be a little bit or it can be a lot. It depends on how bad your thyroid is functioning. So for instance, a TSH of 3.5 may only have 5 to 10 pounds of weight gain. But a TSH of 7.5, okay, well that might have 15 to 20. You see what I mean? It's on a spectrum. So the worse your TSH is or the higher it is, the more likely you are to experience these symptoms but have them even worse. So weight gain depends on that. Hair loss is another big one. You should never be experiencing hair loss. That is not a normal sign. I don't care how old you are. I don't care whatever else is going on in your body. Hair loss is always, always, always a bad sign. Either a sign of nutrient deficiencies or in this case, a thyroid problem or hormone problem. Infertility, that's usually a later sign, but because people are so unhealthy nowadays, infertility can start to rear its head, even at TSHs in the 2.5 to 2.6 range. So it's really important to optimize that TSH if you're having issues with infertility. Fatigue or low energy is another huge one. Again, a lot of things can cause fatigue, um, but absolutely having a high TSH can contribute to fatigue or low energy states. Another one is muscle pain. This one gets missed all the time by a lot of uh, doctors. In fact, I have a really um, important article that if you're having muscle pain, you really need to be looking at your your uh, thyroid levels. This includes, by the way, fibromyalgia because fibromyalgia can be associated with low T3 levels, which are again, often missed by doctors. Dry skin, hopefully you can see that there. Yep, dry skin. So dry skin is another one. So if you just feel like, you know, you haven't had dry skin before and it's not really, you know, the cold winter months um, or the dry season and you're having, you know, flaky skin or dry skin, that again, that's very unusual. Your body should be able to regulate that moisture in your skin. Another important one is a low heart rate. So we're talking low, probably less than 70 you know, somewhere between 60 and 70, maybe in the 50s. But if you're not a conditioned athlete and your heart rate is 55 and you're not taking, you know, a medication that lowers it, you got a problem there. That is not normal. It is normal if you have a really well conditioned heart and you're, like I said, you're a, a, you know, a fitness freak or an athlete. But if you're not, then that's a problem and should be addressed or at least looked at. That is often associated with a low body temperature. So people with these, this high TSH often cannot tolerate cold at all. These are people that will wear socks to go to bed, even in the summer. They're always needing a jacket, even when it's like 78 degrees or maybe that's a bad, maybe 80 degrees or something like that, 80 on up, and they're wearing a jacket. You know, that's really not normal. Like when everyone else is just in a t-shirt and, and shorts and you're needing a jacket and jeans, that's a, that's a sign something is off. And that's generally your body's ability to regulate its body temperature, which is managed by these hormones. So very important there. Depression is another good one, but here the depression, not a good one, but it's another sign of having a high TSH. Now the depression here, tends to occur without any sort of um, a trigger or cause. So if you're just depressed and you don't really have a reason to be depressed, that's an issue, right? You shouldn't just feel down. You should still have enjoyment in the things that you're doing day to day. If you're not experiencing that, that is a problem. Another big one that I see is brain fog. So just the inability to focus, to have the attention that you used to, or to do well at your work or your job, that's, a bit, that's another big issue. Now, a lot of things can cause brain fog and a lot of things can cause depression, but if you have them in the settings of these other symptoms like weight gain and fatigue, fatigue down here, you know, then you're starting to paint the picture that these are all related to your thyroid and to your TSH. Okay, so another one is menstrual irregularities. That kind of goes along with infertility like we talked about. But, you know, if your cycle is becoming irregular and you're in your 30s or something like that and you can't explain it away with perimenopause or menopause, 
that's an issue obviously. And then the last one is constipation. This is another big one for a low thyroid. And what happens is your thyroid controls the transit time in your gut. And so if the thyroid is low, guess what happens? Your gut slows down. And what does that cause? Constipation, it leads to fungal overgrowth, it leads to a bacterial overgrowth and all sorts of other issues inside your gut that need to be addressed. It can also cause, by the way, acid reflux. Then you can get put on a PPI, which isn't the real problem, and then you're now not absorbing nutrients and yada, yada, yada. So you can see here why this is so important. If you understand the symptoms, then and you understand the difference between the optimal and standard levels, then you can figure out what's really happening. So again, you need to have this basic understanding here, and you need to understand what the optimal levels are, and then compare your symptoms um, to, to the level of the, whatever your TSH is. And by the way, um, please do leave a comment below and just tell me what your TSH is. I'm really interested. Most people know their TSH. Um, and so I want you to leave yours below and tell me, are you optimal or are you standard? Like, are, are you going based off the standard levels? Cause that'll be really interesting. All right. That's all I have for you guys today. Make sure if you haven't already to go and download my free thyroid resources. I have a list of eight free thyroid resources, which go into detail on this sort of stuff. I have a list of foods that you should be avoiding if you have thyroid problems. I have a complete list of hypothyroid symptoms checklists, how to look for optimal labs, so much more. Um, and that's all I have for you guys today. Otherwise, I will see you guys in the next one.